Um, so we'll start off by talking about glomerulonephritis. And there's just a few terms that I want everyone to be clear with before we start. One's focal. So when we refer to glomerular disorders, we talk about, uh, we have different descriptive language on the different um, conditions. So for example, focal, uh, focal um, FSGS, focal sclerosing glomerular sclerosis, um, is sort of less than 50% of glomeruli involved. Therefore, it hence the name focal. So less than 50% of the glomeruli involved. Um, and the example is focal segmental glomerular sclerosis or FSGS um, and diffuse. So diffuse is basically greater than 50%. So an example may be diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis, for example. Um, and what proliferative means is that you actually get hypercellular glomeruli. Okay. And um, next is membranous. Okay. I always hear the, the, the phrase membranous glomerulonephritis and to be honest with you, back in MD2, I didn't really understand what it was about. So membranous basically just means there's thickening of GBM, okay? GBM is not your glioblastoma multiform. Um, it's actually your glomerular basement membrane, okay? So thickening of glioblastoma multiform and thickening of glomerular basement membrane means two completely different things. Um, and the next one is you can have primary or secondary. And like most of the conditions you can, for example, when you're talking about tumors, you can get a primary brain tumor, you can get a secondary um, metastatic brain tumor. Um, this tutorial is not focused on brain tumors, I promise you, but I'm just giving an example here. So primary glomerular disease versus secondary glomerular disease. What the difference is, primary, you can think about things that are intrinsically starting from the glomerular, such as your minimal change disease that you see um, in children, um, whereas your secondary glomerular diseases are from your more systemic conditions throughout your body. For example, SOE, for example, diabetic nephropathy are all secondary glomerular diseases, okay? But for the first part of the talk, we will focus more on uh, sort of primary glomerular diseases with slight tangential thinking about secondary glomerular diseases. And then I'll try and fill the gaps in. Um, and those filling the gaps are probably more extensions except for diabetic nephropathy. Okay, so any questions so far? Um, you can always give me a thumbs up if you think the teaching is great. Anyways, so glomerular nephritis is divided, how I think about it, simply non-proliferative and what's the other option, Alex? Proliferative, yes. Um, so non-proliferative and proliferative basically means, as we've put in the definition, one has hypercellular glomeruli and the other one doesn't. Now, if you have hypercellular glomeruli, it means there's inflammation leading to the hypercellularity, okay? If it's non-proliferative, if it's non-proliferative, you don't have any increase in cells in the glomerulus, and those are your nephrotic syndrome. Okay, I think that's the easiest way of thinking it. Therefore, this is your nephritic syndrome when you have inflammation and hypercellularity. Okay, so let's move an arrow, arrow. Um, all right, now, 
Alex has told me that on Wednesday, Jamie gave you an excellent um, lecture. You can watch the recording of um, renal, um, like nephrology in general. But here is like what, what this A3 tutorial gives you is how to approach things and how to memorize stuff. So with nephrotic syndrome and nephritic syndrome, all I think about is two different words. So nephrotic means losing proteins. And I just remember that, okay? So when I have loss of protein, I know I get protein urea and the magic number is 3.5 grams per day. If I'm losing greater than 3.5 grams per day, end of story, it's nephrotic syndrome, okay? There may be an overlap of nephritic, but nephrotic is the major component of the pathology. Now, this means that why do I have protein urea? Because I have changes to my anatomy of my kidney, namely my glomerulus, whether that's podocytes, whether that's mesangio cells, we'll talk about that later. It's changing the dynamic of filtration of blood across my endothelium, across my slit membrane, across my podocytes, okay? It's a change to that filtration system leading to proteinuria. So anatomy, think about anatomy for proteinuria. Now, everything else from nephrotic syndrome, I think about it as if it's a result of losing protein, okay? Um, so first of all, What's the major protein when you think about nephrotic syndrome that is lost? Give me some examples of protein that you, you're losing. Ludi? Um, albumin. Yeah, very good. Albumin. So, so if I'm losing albumin, Ludi, do you mind mute after answering? Yeah, thank you. So if I'm losing albumin, that's two things. Although it's confusing, two things means the exact same thing. Hyperalbuminuria or hypoalbuminemia. So basically, it's saying the same thing. You're losing albumin, okay? That's the only thing you need to know. You're losing proteins in nephrotic syndrome. One of the protein is albumin. Therefore, you get hypoalbuminemia. And with hypoalbuminemia, you get low albumin and what does low albumin mean do you increase or do you reduce your oncotic pressure anyone reduce reduce oncotic pressure therefore you get a fluid shift right you get a fluid shift to, and then that leads to your edema and it makes sense so far any questions so far You're losing the albumin, therefore you get reduced oncotic pressure and increased oncotic pressure outside of the vasculature, therefore fluid shifts out of the vasculature leading to peripheral edema or if you like third spacing. Um, okay, now if I'm losing that albumin and my oncotic pressure is decreased, what is my body automatically trying to do? It's trying to compensate to make uh, by making more like triglycerides and stuff. Yeah, not 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 even just triglycerides. It's making more albumin. Trying to make more albumin. It's trying to make more proteins. It's trying to make all sorts of proteins. And where do those proteins come from? It comes from the liver. And one of those protein is actually lipoprotein. Okay, so liver makes more lipoproteins to try and fix that decrease in oncotic pressure leading to hyperlipidemia okay does that make sense now liver making lipoprotein to fix oncotic pressure that lipoprotein goes into the blood to try and increase that blood pressure uh to increase that oncotic pressure sorry okay now that's the mechanism, first of all. And then let's keep continuing to delve deeper into this. Okay. What other proteins are lost except for albumin? Uh, Freatinin? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, so creatinine is lost, but not really. Not something that I'm looking after. Um, what else? Looking for, sorry. Antithrombin? Thrombin? Yeah. Uh, yeah, antithrombin. But... Interestingly, antithrombin is actually lost with 
other proteins, for example, protein C and protein S. And it's actually the protein C and protein S that is the most important aspect in your fibrolytic pathway, okay? You're right in that antithrombin is lost, but what I'm getting at is your protein C, your protein S, your um, antithrombin. So these are all proteins and in your clotting pathway. And if they are lost, that means there's a defect in your fibrinolytic pathway. Is that correct? Now, if protein C and S is deficient, or if antithrombin is deficient, what do you get? Or what does protein C do? Protein C or S do, first of all? Uh. Protein C helps to break down clots. Yeah, okay. So if you don't have much protein C, what do you get? Excessive bleeding? Yeah. I mean, sorry, excessive so, clot. No, sorry. no, no, no. Sorry. Except, yeah. So if you have a deficiency because you're losing them, you get thrombosis, right? You get more prone to some thrombotic events. Okay, so that's that. What other proteins are lost? your immunoglobulins, right? Your IgG, your IgAs, etc. And because you're losing your immunoglobulins, what are you more prone to? Infection. Yes. Infection. And that is everything you need to know about protein urea, okay? Sorry, everything about nephrotic syndrome. So you're losing proteins. What proteins are there? There's albumin you're losing. There's IgGs. There's antithrombin protein CNS that you're losing. If you're losing albumin, you lead to edema, you lead to hyperlipidemia, as we've explained. If you're losing protein CS, antithrombin, you lead to a prothrombotic state. If you're losing um, IgG, for example, you're more prone to infections. Now, can you think about any other pathology? Taking a step back from renal stuff, can you think about other pathologies that lead to an overall loss of proteins? Malignancy? Yeah, malignancy. But the thing I was thinking about more was sort of less extreme, but something called protein losing enteropathies. Okay. So in protein losing enteropathies, you can also get a similar picture, right? To, to nephrotic syndrome. And the reason is because you're losing proteins and protein takes into place IgG, protein CNS, antithrombin, albumin, right? So it's in protein losing enteropathies, you can get a low albumin, you can get a protein C deficiency, and you can get an immunodeficiency as well. So it's more about how to approach this stuff that I'm teaching you, rather than I have to remember the facts. So rather than remembering every single aspect of nephrotic syndrome, just think about if you're losing proteins, what can those proteins be? And what are the effects of losing those proteins? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, and the Friedich syndrome, I think about it one word, okay? It's called Faro. What does P stand for? Proteinuria. So if you have nephritic syndrome, it doesn't mean you don't lose proteins anymore. It means you're losing less proteins than expected. So the following on effect, for example, your edema, your hyperlipidemia, your prothrombotic state, your immunodeficiency isn't as pronounced as when you have nephrotic syndrome. So if you have proteinuria, you get uh, the magic number is 3.5. You get less than 3.5 per day of loss, okay? And what does H stand for? A major component, hematuria. Okay, that can be microscopic hematuria or macroscopic hematuria. So in hematuria, if you run a, a urine sample, you get red blood cells, you get clasts. This is the definition of hematuria. Once they're present, you have hematuria. If the patient complains of blood in the urine, that's macroscopic hematuria. You don't even need to run the sample because you know there will be red blood cells. You know there will be clasts. What does A stand for? 
Azotania. What's Azotania? Anyone? I can't see the chat, sorry. Increased urea. Yeah, very good. Increased urea. So what uh, first-line testing investigation that you may run is BUN, B-U-N, blood urea nitrogen. And you'll find that urea is elevated. Basically, you have azotemia, okay? Um, what does R stand for? Similarly, red blood cells or clasts, okay? And O, that might be a tricky one. O is your oliguria. And lastly, but not least, hypertension. So when you think about glomerular damage, there's, there's sort of alteration to your renin angiotensin system leading to more angiotensin, for example, leading to hypertension. And therefore, one of the treatment for nephritic syndrome or sort of um, kidney um, injuries in general is giving them ACE inhibitors to modulate that um, re physiological response that is hyperactivated in path pathological states. Okay, so that is basically nephrotic and nephritic syndrome and their differences. Is everyone clear so far? Okay, let's move on. When we talk about proteinuria, so when we talk about this anatomy here, I'm basically saying to you that when you'll have your renal arteries going to your segmental arteries, blah, 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 and imagine this to be your endothelial layer. And this here is your glomerular basement membrane. And these are the podocytes, okay? If you can imagine. You must think that if I have proteinuria, there's something wrong with this filtration system that is, that is leading to my protein losses, okay? And when you have proteinuria, it's often, if not always, the podocytes that is being damaged. And if I have hematuria, it is often the endothelial cells or the GBM that is being um, affected. That's a general rule of principle. However, there may be overlaps of different pathologies and there may be exceptions to this rule. But as a general rule of thumb, if the podocytes is affected, you get proteinuria, okay, PMP. If you get endothelial cells in the base membrane, so the first two things that is affected, you get hematuria. That's a general rule of thumb. And we'll go into more details. So let's talk about, has it, can, I, can I add a new page now? Everyone got this down? Yeah, good. So, non -pluripetive. So, there are three different categories when I think about non proliferative glomerular nephritis, that is. Firstly, is your minimal change. Second, is your FSGS, your focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And third, is your membranous glomerular nephritis. For some reason, I always thought that diabetes just means membranous glomerular nephritis, but it's actually very different, okay? Who can tell me how many different types of membranous glomerular nephritis there is? Is it just two, primary and secondary? There's actually, there's actually just one. From, from what I'm aware. So that was a tricky question, but there are two, uh, actually there are three different types of mem membranoproliferative nephropathies, but with membranous glomerular nephritis, there's usually just one, okay? Um, right, let's keep going. That's, in, that's just a side note, but we'll come back to that side note. So let's talk about minimal change disease. Firstly, epidemiology is very important. Epidemiology, it's the most common in pediatric populations. The common in children, right? Minimal change disease. And it's probably sort of 80% of 
of nephrotic syndrome in, short, in childhood. All right. Now, if a patient comes in with proteinuria, um, puffy eyes, puffy tummy, um, sacral edema, and you are suspecting minimal change disease, what sort of investigations would you do, um, Christian? Uh, urinalysis. Uh, urinalysis, sure. Uh, would you find anything on urinalysis? Uh, proteinuria. Uh, yeah, proteinuria, and um, if you found proteinuria, does that tell you anything? Uh, it strongly suggests that it's nephrotic syndrome. It's nephrotic syndrome. Therefore, you are strongly suspecting it's minimal change disease. Okay, how would you diagnose, gold standard diagnosis, how would you diagnose minimal change disease? Can you do a urine sample and get it somehow? Um, I'm not, I'm not sure about gold standard for diagnosis, but, uh, if on, if they've got nephrotic syndrome and on biopsy, there's nothing to be seen, then you can presume it's either minimal change or FSGS yes. and just give corticosteroids. Okay. Very good. So what you said was renal biopsy. Very good. Renal biopsy. If you don't see anything what would you then move on to is your electromicroscopy, okay? So your electromicroscopy, you can say on your clinical notes when you order it to say suspecting minimal change disease in elect um, and then they will automatically know that they might need electromicroscopy to visualize the abnormal podocytes, okay? So abnormal podocytes seen on EM. And as you said, treatment-wise, prednisolone. That's, that's that for minimal change disease. And what you said about FSGS, let's, let's do FSGS next. It's actually a, a very common, but not the most common adult glomerulonephritis. Okay, remember what we said, what focal means. What does focal mean, Ray? Uh, less than 50% of the... Yes. Yeah. Very good. So less than 50% of glomerulus is affected. So if you have more than 50%, obviously it's not a diagnosis of FSGS. It has to be less than 50% of the glomerulus that is affected. Now, how I remember FSGS is I go FGHI. And uh, so FG basically means focal glomerulus sclerosis. And HI... I know that it's more commonly seen in HIV patients and it's more commonly seen in IV drug uses. So, okay, so that's my FGHI. So HIV and IV drug use. And um, so that's that for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. And as you've said earlier, Christian, you would give prednisolone um, ACE inhibitors and ARBs to actually decrease the um, proteinuria. So ACE inhibitors or ARBs um, to decrease and you can give them uh, prednisolone. Okay, now, uh, what else is there to tell you? Okay. What sort of ethnicities do you think focal sclerosing, a uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis is most common in? I know in the STEP exams they say African Americans, but I don't know if it's actually useful in Australia. <laughs> yeah, it's so what exams? Oh, uh, the USMLE. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you're right. African Americans with uncontrolled hypertension. Okay, so that's the typical presentation. Um, membranous. Okay, so that's it for FSBS. And what about membranous glomerulonephritis? What's the epidemiology of Membranous glomerulonephritis. I think you see hep B positive. 
Yeah, yeah happy positive. So I think about membranous glomerulonephritis and my proliferative membrane, sorry, membro-proliferative glomerulonephritis as is associated with hep B. Um, but sort of age-wise, I'm looking more sort of your 30 to 50-year-old um, patients and they can have SLE, they can have malaria, and they can have hep B. Okay, so this is sort of the typical population that you see it in. Microscopy, you see thickened glomerular-based membrane. Um, so that's a proliferative um, sort of um, presentation. However, um, it is classified under membranous glomerulonephritis because the main symptom of complaint is purely restricted to um, nephrotic syndrome alone. So there's no um, hematuria. Um, and one other test that they use to, to confirm it is through IgG. You know, and treatments, prednisone. And this is the condition where rule of a third comes in. So rule of third means um, population-wise, usually one third of the patients undergo remission, one third undergoes chronic membranous glomerulonephritis after diagnosis and treatment, and one third actually progresses to end-stage renal failure. Okay, so... That's everything about membranous glomerulonephritis. Any questions for non-proliferative glomerulonephritis? Could you just repeat the rule of thirds again? Yeah, so rule of third basically means, as a general rule, one third of the patients diagnosed with membranonephritis, glomerulonephritis, sorry, one third of them undergoes remission, and one third of them retains a chronic membranous glomerulonephritis diagnosis and they suffer from their symptoms chronically and one third actually progresses to end stage renal failure. Make sense? Cool. Yeah, thank you. So that's it for non-proliferative. Now let's move on to proliferative. I'm going to talk to you about three first and I'll leave a fourth category until later and you'll see why. So my proliferative glomerulonephritis, I'll first talk to you about IgA nephropathy. And by all means, um, like for example, membranous glomerulonephritis, you can still get nephritic syndrome, okay? It's not like it's purely in that category. It can progress to affect um, the mesangium. It can, it can progress to affect um, um, sort of the, the, the general filtration matrix such that um, red blood cells can actually go across and you can get going from nephrotic syndrome to nephritic syndrome. But this is to, to help you categorize the different conditions, to help you think about glomerulonephritis as a general rule of thumb. So there's IgA nephropathy. My second one is my membranoproliferative DN. And my third one is my post infectious DN. Okay. I should probably switch the order just to make it more clear and easier to understand for you all. Oh no. How do you do this? Let me do this. And, okay. and here, member of proliferative human refiners. Okay. MP just means membrane proliferative. Okay, now IgA is the most common adult glomerulonephritis. Okay, and A in IgA goes with adult and it goes with mesangium. So, what, what does that mean? You get IgA deposits in mesangial layer. 
um, leading to increased mesangial cells, increasing the matrix thickness. So biopsy is needed to, um, as a gold standard to diagnose IgA nephropathy. And what's the usual presentation of IgA nephropathy? <clears throat> Can anyone tell me? Synpharyngitic like infection. Yeah, so, so when you think about synpharyngitic infections, it's usually um, talking about post-infectious, okay? So th that's a clear distinction here. IgA nephropathy, it might not be synpharyngitic because synpharyngitic means it's probably due to strep pyogenes. However, if I have a viral urti, that's what's sort of the most common presentation of IgA nephropathy. So if you're talking about synpharyngitic infections, it's most accurate to say synpharyngitic infections occurring two to six weeks prior to my um, renal episode, that's most likely to be my post-infectious glomerular nephritis. However, if I'm talking about IgA nephropathy, I talk about a presentation which occurs one to two days after my ERT. And what causes ERT most likely is viral organisms. For example, your adenovirus, norovirus, rotavirus, whatever. Um, your ERT um, is uh, most commonly viral. So you can get viral illnesses and then you can get one to two days after that, you can get IgA nephropathy. Does that make sense, Christian? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, good. Um, and typically, they actually present with macroscopic hematuria. Okay. Um, and as a prognostic factor, 20% of them progresses to end stage renal failure. And treatments for IgA nephropathy, anyone knows? Could it be immunotherapy? Yeah, immunotherapy. What sort of immunotherapy? Is it prednisolone again? I don't think prednisolone would be a good idea, but I don't know what the alternative would be. Yeah, so prednisolone, <laughs> prednisolone is always used for glomerular nephritis, but in, in IG nephropathy, because they might need stronger doses, for example, or longer duration even, you can give them cyclophosphamide. Mm -hmm. Prednisolone. Basically, steroid spurring drugs you can use as well. Okay. Um, what else? Okay, there's another name for IgA nephropathy. Anyone know? Burgers disease? Yeah, Burgers disease. But Monash, people actually know a lot. I'm pretty sure Melbourne Uni <laughs> kids don't know that much by third year. Um, okay, so that's it for IgA nephropathy. Now, post-infectious glomerular nephritis, what's the cause? As Christian alluded to, it's usually due to strep pyogenes, okay? Um, and therefore, what sort of investigations would you order? ASOT? Yeah, for those of you who don't know what ASOT is, um, it's anti-streptolysin O teta. Um, and that's for sort of um, um, measuring your group A beta hemolytic streptococcal infections. So you run an ASOT and increasing ASOT and what else? That's an extension rate, do you know? Increase ASOT teta and what else? I'm not too sure, sorry. Anti-DNAs. Anti that's just an extension, you don't have to be sorry. I don't think anyone knows. Um, a stunt. Uh, okay, anti streptolysin teta. Um, okay, for bonus points, what other things would you expect? You get humps on the uh, EM. Yeah, humps on the EM. Uh, what other lab in terms of like when you run blood tests, what other things can you see? without going to sort of your microscopy and biopsy.
so so what what uh, was it? Way was it? Yeah. So um, what Way was talking about is you can run immunofluorescence on electron microscopy or light um, microscopy, and you get this lumpy, bumpy appearance. But what I'm after is if I'm not doing a biopsy result, what other lab um, findings can I um, have in post-infectious glomerulonephritis, which raises the suspicion of that diagnosis? Decrease complement. Decrease what, sorry? Complement. Yeah, very good. So C3. my C3. 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 Yeah, so usually C3 is the thing we look at. C4 may be decreased, but C3 is the most sensitive, I think, um, in those conditions. Um, and the typical textbook for biopsy result is under microscopy, it looks starry sky appearance. Okay, so above anti DNA's um, anti streptolysin OT is raised with low C3, and also on biopsy, you get star sky appearances as well as lumpy, bumpy appearances on immunofluorescence. And the cause is usually sympharyngitic meaning due to strep pyogeny. And the typical presentation, which, which strongly differentiates it between Berger disease or IgA nephropathy to post-infectious glomerulonephritis, it actually occurs two to six weeks after strep um, sort of symptoms, okay? Now, when you have a patient who presents with post-infectious glomerulonephritis, how many weeks do you think the C3 take to normalize? Anyone? Like a month? Yeah, very close. Six to eight weeks usually for C3 to normalize. So, um, so it, when you when you give them treatment, and I'll ask you what treatments later. Um, usually, the C3 will take six to eight weeks to normalize. So don't be surprised with the sort of a chronic low C3 until six to eight weeks after the presentation. Now, what what treatment would you give for post infection? One word. Starts with S. Ends with abortive. So, like, you do self results. So, yeah, very good. Supportive therapy, right? So, supportive therapy for post infectious glomerulonephritis, and patients have really good prognosis and they usually recover. However, you can also add diuretics if you think the patient's fluid overloaded. Diuretics, okay? So you can give them furosemide or Lasix. So I know, why is Lasix called Lasix? Oh, sorry, Ray. Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry, it was a white chart. Um, but I just was wondering, in terms of PSGN, yeah. I heard the prognosis for kids is pretty good but for adults, it's pretty bad. Is that true or is that? PSGN? Yeah. A post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis? Yeah. For what, sorry? Like the prognosis, if you get yeah. like PSGN. For adults, yeah. it's pretty bad, but as opposed to kids, it's pretty good. I'm not sure if that's evidence-based. Well, I'm not very familiar with that particular literature, but from my knowledge, um, people with post-streptococcus glomerulonephritis usually recover with supportive therapy plus diuretics. So if you treat it, if you treat them symptomatically, they usually recover. And I do know though, with um, IgA nephropathy, um, sort of the earlier that you treat the IgA nephropathy, the better the prognosis. Okay. Sorry, I can't help you there. Um, so yeah, going back, so why is Lasix called Lasix? It refers to its duration lasting six hours. Yeah, very good. You, you heard that from Victor, didn't you? I think so, yeah. 
I know Victor, it sounds familiar. Well, that's recent. Yeah, Victor or someone. Oh, I may, um, I may have said it. I have, I may have said it last year. In the Netflix, maybe. Good. Oh, yeah. Good. yeah, good, Alex. It definitely sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on. Um, membro glomerular. Sorry. Hey, sorry. What was that again? Why was it called laces? Because the duration it takes to act, or or maybe maybe more accurately, um, the time for Lasix to wash out. Um, so thinking about half life and the duration of action, it's about six hours. So when you give Lasix, it's functional for six hours until it goes to a subtherapeutic sort of concentration. That's usually six hours. That's why it's called Lasix. Okay, is there like a connection to the name, like the? Um, yeah, yeah, so Lasix is spelt L A S I X. Okay, so so L A and six. Oh, there we go. Hip, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're just saying, like, I don't know if that's the original intention, but Lasix, the duration of action is six hours. Okay, and uh, that's just a small clinical um, trivia knowledge that you can use on one of those trivia nights. Anyways, membroproliferative glomerular um, nephritis, or I should say membroproliferative nephropathies, okay? So, although I've put it under proliferative, it can cause nephrotic syndrome. You, and usually it's an overlap. And there are, I would say there's three types. So there's type one, type two, and type three. But I, in my mind, I tend to group type one with type two and three. So type one is associated with, so I think what Wei was saying, um, hep infection, hep B and hep C. So remember back to our previous picture, membranous is associated with um, SLE malaria and hep B. My membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis is also associated with hepatitis and SLE, okay? Um, and hep B, hep C, SLE, there's another thing. Okay, yeah, that's right. Another thing is, what's SBE? Anyone know? Is it the um, rheumatic fever? And not really. So subacute bacterial endo endocarditis, okay, so SBE. Um, all right, who wants an extension? Give me a thumbs up if you want an extension. Okay. So um, what are the typical presentations or peripheral stigmata of um, bacterial endocarditis? And you'll know it's Janeway lesions, Ross spots, yeah, those sort of things, which you read on textbooks. Now, in nowadays, what is um, sort of, when you have a patient with tricuspid um, regurgitation, for example, what do you think the most common cause of, um, of um, bacterial endocarditis is? And in that case, it will be acute bacterial endocarditis. What do you think the organism might be? Staph aureus, yeah? With those IV drug users um, injecting themselves, um, sort of having skin flora into the bloodstream. So Staph aureus is usually the most common cause of IV DU um, related acute bacterial endocarditis. Now, the typical things that you see, for example, Janeway lesions, Ross spots, whatever, um, do you get that in acute endocarditis? in Staph aureus infections? The answer is no. Uh, yeah, sorry, Wei, go on. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say yes, but I guess so, yeah. Cause I just remember this guy in, our, in the ID ward and he had like Janeway lesions and everything, but yeah. yes. So, so you, all right, so there may be exceptions, but usually you don't. And there's one exception that can occur. So 
it's very unusual for you to get staph aureus associated acute bacterial endocarditis leading to Janeway lesions, rust spots, and Oslo nodes, okay? So when you see those bacterial um, endocarditis proof or stigmata is only when you have a left circulation bacterial endocarditis leading to, for example, vegetations on mitral slash aortic valves. And the reason is because if you think about the circulation around the heart, if you have a right-sided um, tricuspid regurgitation or vegetation leading to regurgitation, your embolic um, um, sort of your septic emboli is more localized to the right side or into your pulmonary um, circulation. Whereas the peripheral stigmata is always a left-sided thing. So you would actually often get those peripheral stigmata in left-sided heart conditions. Um, so who, what causes left-sided subacute bacterial endocarditis? In that case, it's typically an organism called Streptococcus sanguis or Streptococcus viridans family. Okay, that's an that's an extension um, for you. Anyways, so subacute bacterial endocarditis, SLE, Hep B, and Hep C um, are all the primary pathologies which may lead to secondary member of proliferative glomerulonephritis. And the typical histology that you see um, is what described, what's described as cram track. And why do you have tram track? It's because you have a double layered PDF. Okay. Um, and you can get mesangial deposits, subendothelial deposits, and with this condition, um, SLE as well, you can get low S3. If you have low, uh, low, sorry, low C3, if you have low C3, it doesn't necessarily mean it's post-infectious glomerulonephritis. It can be member of a proliferative glomerulonephritis with hematuria. Okay, now, um, what else is there? So I've talked about Hep B, Hep C. I've talked about SLE. I've talked about subacute bacterial endocarditis. This is another thing called cryoglobulinemia. Okay. In cryoglobulinemia, patients can present with palpable purpura, arthralgia, and nephritic slash nephrotic syndrome. And that nephritic syndrome is actually due to type 1 membrane proliferative nephropathies as well. And in those conditions, you get low C3 and usually a positive hep C. Okay. So they actually don't know exactly why, but those are associated together. So cryoglobulinemia, mixed cryoglobulinemia associated with low C3 and positive HCV, patients can present with public purpura, arthralgias, nephritic and nephrotic syndromes. Okay, now, at the start of the tutorial, I've asked, um, what sort of picture does lupus give you? And I said to Alex that it can give you a mixed picture. And um, a lot of the conditions like the autoimmune-led um, glomerulonephritis, they tend to have a low C3. So for you to understand the differential diagnosis for nephritic and nephrotic syndrome with a low C3, you want to think about, when I talk about a low C3, if that comes back, there are actually a few things. I'll just group it for you here. So you can get post-infectious, you can get membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis, um, including the mixed, the mixed cryoglobulinemia that I was talking about, and you can get lupus. Okay, so when you have low C3, those are the differential diagnoses that I'm considering. Is everyone clear on that now? So. Going back to membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis, type one I've told you is associated with or secondary to Hep B, C, SLE, subacute bacterial endocarditis and cryoglobulinemia. The treatment for it is first of all, corticosteroids and, cytotox and actually cytotoxic agents would help as well. Now, there's also type two and three. Similar to type one, 
type 2 and 3 membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis also causes nephritic slash nephrotic syndromes. And it's often idiopathic, meaning we don't know the cause. And the thing to differentiate type 1 from type 2 and 3 is the lab and histology um, findings. Um, and you can get sort of intramembranous dense deposits. Um, and usually those are the C3 nephritic factor. But you, I don't think you need to know that much detail. But just know that there are different types of membranoproliferative. There's usually only one type of membranous um, glomerulonephritis. Um, that is leading to non-proliferative, whereas membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis is classified under the proliferative um, category and gives you hematuria. But with both type 1, type 2, and type 3 um, MPGN, you can always get a mixed picture of both nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. Treatments is um, essentially the same between type 1, 2, and 3. So cytotoxic agents, corticosteroids, for example, you can use tacrolimus, prednisolone, um, and other cyclophosphamides, for example, for immunosuppression. Is everyone clear on those three now? Okay. I was just confused with um, the mixed cryoglobinemia. Is that a, like a separate thing from MBGN? Uh, okay, so it's more like an associated condition. So remember how I said um, MPGN often occurs, oh, at least type 1 often occurs secondary to hep BC, often occurs secondary to SLE, often occurs secondary to SBE, so subacute bacterial endocarditis, and it can, uh, it can also occur separately to mixed cryoglobulinemia. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So mixed cryoglobulinemia is its own condition and MPGN can develop secondarily to cryoglobulinemia. And those patients tend to occur with um, pelvic purpura, for example, arthralgias and, um, and um, renal problems. Is that clear? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Does anyone know what um, cryoglobulinemia means? I think cryo means uh, cold. So maybe it has something to do with the cold, like clumping together so, or something. So, yeah, so, so basically it's just another form of um, vasculitis, basically. Okay. Um, and does anyone know sort of Remember I said to you, cry, mixed cryoglobulinemia patients tend to um, occur with hep C infections. Um, and so the argument here is if, whether it's the hep C that's actually causing the member proliferative glomerulonephritis or whether it's um, sort of cryoglobulinemia that's causing the membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, okay? But cryoglobulinemia is probably another lecture in itself where I talk about all the autoimmune conditions together. Any questions here? So just think about it as a autoimmune condition. Everyone good to continue? We just have a little bit more to go. Okay, good. Let me give a new page. So last category, which also falls under proliferative. So we've talked about IgA. We've talked about member of proliferative. We've talked about post-infectious, how to differentiate between post-infectious and glomerulonephritis. Uh, sorry, how to differentiate between post-infectious GN versus IgA nephropathy. Um, the last category is my rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And those are my Chris and see, um, shaped glomeruli on histology, okay? So crescent shape, you think about rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis. And those are divided into vasculitic. Hmm, and my good patients. Now, 
what order would you like to go in, into? Vasculitic first or, or good pastures? Can we do good pastures first? Sure. Um, all right. Who can tell me what good pastures is? Anti-GBM. Yeah. Uh, anti yeah. Is it a type two, three, four? Which type is it in terms of hypersensitivity? What is it a type three? It's actually a type two. Okay. It's a type two. Um, so I think about it as if in type three, um, there's usually just one thing that I can think of affecting the kidney, and that's Hanox Sherlin purpura, or or actually SLE as well. Hanox Sherlin purpura and SLE can lead to renal problems as a type three immune complex de deposition, whereas anti GBM is sort of antibody antigen interaction. That's more my type two hypersensitivity, which is my antibody mediated destruction. Okay, so for good Parkinson's disease, how do patients present? Hemoptysis. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, what was that, Alex? I said hemoptysis. Yeah, hemoptysis. So with your Canadian accent, it's very hard to match. <laughs> it's all right. So present with nephritic syndrome and hemoptysis. Why is that? Why do you get hemoptysis? Uh, because I guess as the name implies, you're targeting sort of like the basement membranes within the lung parenchyma. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, um, so basically the anti GBM is targeting both the lung, um, and the kidney. That's it. That's all you need to know about good pastures. Um, and do you know what sort of epidemiology it tends to occur in? Uh, I don't want to sound racist, but earlier this week, I did see a, uh, well, someone born from China with good pastures. Yeah, I don't know if it's more common in Southeast Asian population, but I, I, was, sort of, I was sort of thinking sort of men over women. Well, I didn't mean it that way, but like more men I tend to have it uh, than sort of women. And usually it's sort of mid 20s, um, 230s maybe, but it actually doesn't, um, it tends to spare sort of the elderly population. Now, a lot of the only immune conditions you actually see it a lot in sort of um, mid 20s um, sort of female patients, but good parts is actually more predominant in males. So that's the distinction that I want to get. And um, on histology, what, what, what investigations would you use? What, sorry, what investigations specifically for good pastures would you want to request for? Immunofluorescence. Yeah, immunofluorescence. And on immunofluorescence, you see anti-GBM. So anything that you want to um, look for a antibody for, um, you would uh, you would probably want to order immunofluorescence. Okay, what other conditions is associated with good pasture syndrome? Or what other investigations would you like, right? Um, maybe like an antibody test. Yeah, we've already ha we've already done that with the immunofluorescence, though. Would you order anchors? Uh, you probably would order anchor, but uh, that's what I'm getting at. So I'm talking about vasculitic causes later. So if, I'm, if my patient presents with hemoptysis, I obviously want anchor as well. But let's just say I'm pretty confident it's good pastures and I want specific investigations for good pastures. But you're right. If your patient presents with hemoptysis, you are suspecting, okay, rapid progressive glomerulonephritis with chrysenteric bodies. You do want to differentiate 
it's an anchor positive or anchor negative. Because if it's anchor positive, I know it's probably my um, Wigner granulomatosis, microscopic um, polyangitis or eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangitis, another name being Schirk-Strauss syndrome. Um, but in if it's anchor negative, what other investigations do you want? It's not simple. I'm just going to guess myeloma. Uh, no, no. So it's not simple. FBE. Why? Because they tend to present with iron deficient anemia. Okay. First of all. Second of all, sputum culture. Why do you want sputum culture? Because you get something called a hemosiderin filled um, macrophages in the sputum. Okay. And lastly, chest x-ray to look for Primary infiltrates. All make sense? Yeah. Okay. Good. Now, in anti GBM disease, because I have a lot of anti GBM antibodies, I would want to get rid of them. So, how would I want to get rid of them? Maybe plasma exchange. Um... Yeah, very good. Plasma exchange or plasmapheresis. What does plasmapheresis mean? Or well, like, tell me about plasma exchange. I'm not too sure on the exact uh, details, but I'm, I just know that it's used to uh, replace things like antibodies or proteins. Yeah. Um, yeah, very good. So uh, how I think about it, I think about a key term called extracorporeal. So extracorporeal means outside of the body. I'm basically using um, stimulating factors to release my um, sort of immune cells and then I can extract that outside of my, my body, determine which ones I need to get rid of and then put it back into the body, okay? So that's how I tend to think about it. Uh, yes, Alex has put in a link, which I'm not sure what it's about. Anyways, yeah, I, don't, I, can't, I can't really read papers. I don't know why, but anyways, yes, Ray. Uh, it's like John, but um, I was just wondering, um, yeah. what's the difference between plasmapheresis and uh, dialysis? Okay. Or is there no difference? Yeah, so I think, okay, so the principle is the same in both, in that you're basically taking stuff out of the body, right? But in dialysis, it's more sort of taking a whole, it, you're taking the whole of the plasma out. And then you're um, you're reducing the, the toxic substances, um, and then you're putting it back. Extra corporeal as well, but in plasma phoresis, there's an extra step in that you actually have to um, release all the all the immune cells. Um, I think it's called colon colonizing stimulating factor or something like that, um, uh, like G granulocyte um, granulocyte colony stimulating factor or whatever. You actually have to, uh, there's an extra step in plasmapheresis in that you have to free all the, um, all the immune cells first for you to be able to get rid of them and then put it back to the patient. Does that make sense? Whereas dialysis, yeah, so. more, dialysis is more sort of directly taking the blood away, removing the toxic substances and putting it back. So essentially it's the same thing, but um, it's just extra steps because the objective that we're trying to achieve is different. And the indication is obviously different, for example, too. So for plasma phoresis, you, you tend to um, give it to patients with a high um, autoantibody load, um, whereas um, dialysis, you, you know, the typical indication, AIOU, so metabolic acidosis, um, electrolyte disturbances, extreme hyperkalemia, extreme hyper whatever, um, uh, and sort of if the patient's intoxicated, if the patient has oliguria, if the patient has um, uremic syndrome, for example, uremic pericarditis, then the obvious um, indication um, there is for dialysis treatment, whereas plasmapheresis is used for different other pathologies. Uh... Oh, there you go.
Yeah. Yeah. Does that clarify your question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I was just always confused, but yeah, that, that definitely. It's, it's, yeah, it's pretty much, well, it's, yeah, it's, you're removing different stuff, essentially. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay, so other than plasmapheresis, what else is there? Can you give RVIG? Uh, RVIG is not 10 to be used in good pastures. So you do high dose steroids. I don't know if IVIG is used. Maybe you can educate me there. And so usually that's the treatment. So cyclophosphamide, high dose steroids and plasma paresis as a combination to treat good pastures. And um, ten, patients do go on to have end stage renal failure um, despite the treatment, okay? Okay, now, what's another, which I'm not gonna write here, what's another anti-GBM disease you can see affecting the kidney? It's probably a more difficult one. It's probably hereditary. Alport? Yes, Alport syndrome, very good. So. Hereditary glomerulonephritis does occur. Um, Alport syndrome, it's also anti-GBM antibody um, and they can recur after transplants even. So when you have a kidney transplant for those kids, anti-GBM nephritis can reoccur. They tend to occur sort of in boys, again, um, uh, sort of five to 20 years of age, um, but they can actually have asymptomatic hematuria, that is. So they might not present with sort of macroscopic, macroscopic hematuria, but you do see GBM splitting on electron microscopy. And the, the typical presentation is sensory neural deafness. That's the typical, typical presentation and eye disorders. Okay. So that's just at the back of your mind in the pediatric population, there's also an anti-GBM disease called Alport syndrome, but it's hereditary. Okay, now let's move on to vasculitic. There are probably three vascular, uh, yeah, three that I'll probably tell you about. Veganus granulatosis, uh, microscopic polyangitis, and Schurk's strauss okay? So veganus is now called um, granul granulomatosis with polyangitis. And the reason for the change of the name is political uh, because I think Vigna did some really bad things um, back in the Nazi times. So um, they removed the name and called it something else, um, which, actually, which actually sort of tells you that there's a component of granuloma formation and there's a component of polyangitis. So poly means many, so small vessels. Um, angitis means inflammation, so vasculitis of the blood vessels. Okay, so how I think about veganers is that um, veganers has granulomas and the other ones don't, okay? And those are the three sites that are affected with veganers. Whereas my um, microscopic polyangitis, so my MP, I don't have sinus um, involvement, so I only have kidney and lung. Uh, and with the last one, Schurkstrauss, so it's, it's that's your eosinophilic um, polyangitis. Um, so that's your um, kidney. Plus asthma, okay? It can actually trigger asthma. Um, okay, so let's talk about each separately. Veganers. If I'm suspecting in a rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis patient, I'm suspecting vasculitic picture. I'm suspecting 
Figners, I'm suspecting MP, I'm suspecting um, Shirk Strauss. You run an anchor or an autoimmune screen or a vasculitic screen looking for the different anchors. So here in veganous granulatosis or small vessel vasculitis is its general sort of category under, you will find C anchor. Um, and in microscopic polyangitis, it's P anchor. What does anchor stand for? In Schurg Strauss. What does anchor stand for, anyone? Is it anti neutrophil cytoplasmic? Yeah, anti neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. That's what anchor stands for. Um, how I remember it is I only remember Vigno C and um and the the rest is p okay um okay so for so for each one the treatment's very similar in that you need plasmapheresis cyclophosphamide and high dose steroids just as in um good pastures disease um however the reason why you want to achieve a diagnosis for vasculitis is that for the other symptoms that are present, you want an explanation for those um, symptoms as well relating to the other systems. For example, if the patient's more prone to asthma, then you know it's probably Shirk Strauss, um, eosinophilic granulomatosis, the polyangitis. So um, essentially how you differentiate Shirk Strauss from the rest is increased IgE. If you go back to the name, Shirk Strauss, eosinophilic granulomatosis and polyangitis versus granulomatosis with polyangitis, the difference here is purely the word eosinophilic, right? Okay, so basically how to differentiate between two, firstly with the anchor and secondly with um, an increase in IgE, okay? And that's pretty much it. Uh, about the vasculitis bit. Any questions? Let's see if I've missed anything. In terms of moving. Okay. Oh, we'll talk about two last conditions just to fill in the space. So is everyone clear about glomerular nephritis now? Just as a quick recap, we've done through definition. We've gone through what nephrotic and nephritic syndromes are, non-proliferative, nephrotic, proliferative, nephritic, although they can have overlaps. Non-proliferative leading to nephrotic syndrome can have minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or membranous glomerulonephritis. Minimal change common in children. Treat them with prednisolone, abnormal podocytes seen on histology. Focal segmental glomerulonephritis, HFGHI seen in HIV and IV drug use patients, usually seen in African Americans with uncontrolled hypertension. You treat them with ACE and ARBs. Now, ACE and ARBs are actually used in many of the nephrotic syndrome just to um, augment the renal angiotensin system. Okay, so in minimal change and even membranous glomerulonephritis, sometimes ACE inhibitors are used, for example, in Nalapril. Okay, membranous glomerulonephritis, 30 to 50 year old associated with SLE, malaria, and hep B. IgG immunofluorescences are used to detect um, um, anti, uh, sort of IgG deposition, and prednisolone is used as immunosuppression rule of third. So one third um, um, undergoes remission, one third undergoes chronic member membranous glomerulonephritis, and one third actually progresses to end stage renal failure. In proliferative, there are three, uh, four major conditions. So Berger disease or IgA nephropathy, most common in adults, 
um, post-infectious glomerulonephritis, and I told you how to differentiate between the two in terms of the time frame, so you take a detailed history, whereas post-infectious, two to six weeks after a sympharyngitic infection, usually supportive therapy plus diuretics. Member of no proliferative glomerulonephritis, on the other hand, has type 1, type 2, type 3, where in type 1, it's associated with hep B, hep C, cryogoblinemia, SLE, and subacute bacterial endocarditis. So usually on histology, it presents as tram tract because of the double-layered glomerular, glomerular basement membrane and low C3 counts. When thinking about low C3 counts, it's usually post-infectious glomerulonephritis, member of proliferative glomerulonephritis, and you can get a mixed cryoglobulinemia associated with membrane of proliferative glomerular nephritis. You can get lupus nephritis or leading to a low C3 count. And sort of the last category, which is your more, it's um, more dangerous and you need rapid treatment with high dose steroids, cyclophosphamide and plasmapheresis is your vasculitic causes and your good pastures syndrome. Your good pastures syndrome, another thing to keep in mind is in, Popular, um, in pediatric populations between five to 10 year old um, male, you want to think about Alport syndrome if they present with sensory neural defects and eye disorders, but with good pastures type type sensitivity and GBM antibodies. Um, you, you run immunofluorescence, FB to look for iron deficient anemia, sputum um, to look for hemosiderin field macrophages and sputum, um, spelling error here, chest x-ray, pulmonary, looking for pulmonary infiltrates. In vasculitis, you always run a vasculitic screen or autoimmune screen um, for anchor positive um, pathologies. And if it's C anchor, vegan is P anchor, MP or Schirk Strauss. How do I differentiate between two? Schirk Strauss has asthma and usually there's an inner synophilia with Schirk Strauss as well. Know the different names. Is everyone clear so far? Okay, so last two, diabetic nephropathy. Usually nephrotic syndrome is caused. Um, the two forms. So your first form is a diffuse hyalinization, and that's your earlier, or I wouldn't say earlier, but it's just two different separate forms, and your nodular glomerular sclerosis, or your chemo Wilson, chemo Wilson lesions. And um, under diabetic nephropathy, um, you, or you know all the microvascular and macrovascular complications of diabetes. I won't go through that. Um, you, you get increased manual matrix. Um, to treat those. insulin and then you can give ACE inhibitors and arms. Okay. That's it. Diabetic neuropathy. Uh, let's oh, what else should I give you? Lupus. Lupus nephritis. We've talked about low C3. Uh, um, there's time. one, two, four. Uh, ready? Um, what else? So you would often look for lupus nephritis in a patient presenting with malar rash, for example, or other symptoms of lupus. Um, again, mesangial proliferation um, plus immune 
definition. Oh yeah, uh, probably one thing that I've forgotten is with type three hypersensitivity. Remember, I talked about two conditions that which can cause um, impaired kidney function. One's lupus nephritis, and the other one is actually um, Hanox Schellen purpura, which is a small vessel vasculitis that is often seen in children, not in adults who can present with palpable purpura arthritis, abdominal pain. Um, and the lab histology is actually identical to your adult IgA nephropathy, okay? That's your HSP. Um, and then you treat it, supportive therapy, plus minus glucocorticoids, okay? So that's not the HSP in, um, in Flinders Lane. That's the Hanox Sherlin purpura HSP. So... Um, also a differential for HSP can be mixed cryoglobulinemia. Okay. That's just a side note or extension just to, for a complete picture. Um, when you are sort of what, what two conditions in terms of type three hypersensitivities can cause, um, glomer, uh, can cause impaired, um, kidney function. And then, you know, okay. So first of all, lupus nephritis, it can cause both nephrotic nephritic syndrome. And there's also herdoxial and purpura. Um, HSP, which can present similar to mixed cryoglobulinemia, then I might think about membrane proliferative glomerulonephritis as well, type 1, 2, 3, mostly type 1, which is associated with hep C infections. Um, and then if the patient does have hernoxial and purpura and he, uh, he or she may be a child, then I give them supportive therapy plus minus glucocorticoids such as prednisolone. Okay. That's just for a completeness um, picture so that I'm telling you about HSP. Otherwise, it's pretty low yield. Anyways, um, so uh, lupus nephritis. So again, prednisolone cytotoxic therapy sl to slow disease progression. And lastly, Renal amyloidosis. Who knows what stain I use for amyloidosis? Congo red. Yes. Congo red. Uh, what color do I see on Congo red? It's like apple green. Yes, apple green. Fire refrigerants. Uh, why do you see apple green? I have no idea. Anyway, I think it's to do with the wavelength of light that's been transmitted after you've uh, absorbed the energy. So you reflect a certain wavelength of about 580 something nanometers. I can't remember the exact details. But anyways, um, uh, what else? You see, what do you see? You see nodular... Very low scroll and on electromicroscopy, you get amyloid fibrils. Okay. Um, so renal amyloidosis is divided into two different types. There's type one, which is your plasma cell is all right, tell me the definition of dyscrasia. The ab abnormal, simple abnormality in the blood, blood cell counts? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, dyscrasia is just a fancy word of saying abnormality. So when I have a plasma cell abnormality, that's um, what it's essentially saying. So type 1 is to do with plasma cell abnormalities. And um, type two, which deposits on my um, on my uh, glomerulus, and my type two is infectious or inflammatory. Okay, um, those are the two different types of amyloidosis. Um, now. I think it's uh, Wei Chung. Um, so you told me about multiple myeloma. 
didn't you? I think so. Yeah. So multiple myeloma patients can get renal amyloidosis, and it's because um, the like they tend to have inflammatory diseases or uh, multiple myeloma um, present, um, which I'm not sure if it's causing one another or associated with one another, but patients tend to have multiple myeloma or chronic inflammatory disease at the time of presentation. So they can have TB, they can have rheumatoid arthritis, they can have multiple myeloma, okay? So that's actually related with renal amyloidosis rather than um, what we were talking about, which was from memory, good pastor syndrome. And uh, what else can I tell you for renal amyloidosis? Treatment. What's the treatment for amyloidosis? Is it plasma phoresis as well? Yeah, it's um. So I think if it's associated with my multiple myeloma, you treat the multiple myeloma with bone marrow transplantation. But again, it's prednisolone. So when in doubt, you prednisolone. And melphalan. Okay. Which is, I think, another immunosuppressive agent. Uh, to oh, well, it's to treat multiple myeloma. Um, yeah, ovarian cancer, multiple myeloma. It's an, another alkylating agent, so cytotoxic agent. All right. That's probably it for today. Any questions so far? So those three is to complete the picture outside of glomerulonephritis. So for those of you who want a screenshot, that's the first page. That's the second page. That's the third page. fourth and fifth and you should be an expert on glomerulonephritis plus nephrotic nephritic syndromes which took us one and a half hours good timing hey jason yes is this the last session you'll be doing for this year uh maybe maybe not so i'm going to run a neurology tutorial uh lecture on mm -hmm. wednesday the 22nd of september Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, I think I might resume probably towards the end of the year if if I'm going to do one. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so I won't see you guys for a while in terms of A3 tutorials, but I, I can still organize something if you guys have some interesting um, suggestions. I know, I know cardiac murmurs were suggested before, so I'll definitely do a cardiac murmur session sometime. So keep a lookout in the group. Um, I might do a cardiac murmur. I might do one on diuretics because um, I find that to be a um, pretty high yield topic. Um, yeah, I can do one on anything pretty much. Yeah, I know you also like your brain tumors. So I think um, something like that could be pretty interesting as well. Yeah, so brain tumors, I think it's very interesting, but I don't think a lot of people um, would find it high yield. So yeah, but I, I love, I love sort of um, the different brain tumors. So low grade gliomas, glioblastoma, uh, oligo, uh, oligodendritic gliomas, astrocytomas, uh, pleomorphic xanthocytomas. Um, yeah, all those stuff is very interesting. Um, yeah, I can talk to you guys about one of those sometime, but yeah, in the short term, the, the short answer is no. Um, no more toots in the short term. I think uh, give you guys a break from all the Saturday morning tortures. Um, but yeah, I'll be back probably October, November if I do find some time. But it, it, it legit takes me sort of 30 minutes to prepare a topic. So even if um, you guys want something simultaneously, like desperate for an exam, like you can't understand something, just shoot me a message um, either in the group um, as a post or just shoot me a message and I can try and facilitate that. Thank you so much, Jason.
All good. Thanks, Justin. Yes. Thank you. Oh, gee.